Spin orbit qubits, at their most basic level of understanding, are simply electrons. The spin of these electrons can be either spin up or spin down. And as we know, usually we use oscillating magnetic fields to manipulate these spins. However, the special thing about spin orbit qubits is that these electrons can be manipulated through their spin orbitals through the use of electric fields. But to better understand how they work, we need to first dive into the basic architecture of the semiconductor. So this funny looking picture here is a semiconductor for the spin qubit. The qubit itself is a blue arrow right here, and it can either be spin up or spin down whenever we measure it. And as you can see, this spin is manipulated by this oscillating magnetic field, B1. As the device is running, current originates from the source. And any time a spin on an electron encounters the energy well, it tunnels into this donor. And then the electron is plunged into a deeper energy well, and the magnetic field is able to manipulate the spin, which gives the electron spin a new orientation. For any qubit system, we want to first be able to initialize it to some predetermined state, second, be able to manipulate the qubit, and then finally read the qubit's final state. So in our system, we first initialize a qubit to spin down, plunge it into an energy well from which we can manipulate the qubit, and then we bring it back out of its energy well. If the qubit is spin up, it escapes and we are able to measure a current. If it's spin down, the qubit does not escape into the wire and no current is measured. This semiconductor qubit system was designed by Ply et al. in 2012, and it's been able to achieve coherence times of up to hundreds of microseconds with Han echo and dynamic decoupling, and it's been able to achieve error rates of less than 20%. However, this architecture still presents some challenges, including the extremely low temperatures that are required and the oscillating magnetic fields that we need to generate. The difficulties surrounding generating oscillating magnetic fields involve a lot of complex engineering issues, but we can get some intuition by taking a look at Maxwell's equations. These are Maxwell's equations, which you have all probably forgotten by now. But the important thing to realize here is the generation of the magnetic field B. You will notice a suppression factor of mu naught epsilon naught, which is equal to 1 over c squared. Thus, to generate a magnetic field, we've effectively generated a huge oscillating electric field. And this isn't always possible on a local chip. Now you notice that to generate an electric field, the same suppression factor is not there. So the actual engineering issues surrounding this are a little bit more complex, but this provides a general intuition for why it's harder to generate an oscillating magnetic field versus an electric field. This is where spin orbit qubits come in. Rather than manipulating the qubits with magnetic fields, we can use electric fields to shift the positions of the orbitals of the qubits. We go through the exact same process as a semiconductor. The electron is initialized to some predetermined spin, and then we plunge the electrons into a energy level that they cannot escape. And then we flip one of the qubits, this time with electric fields instead of magnetic fields. We bring them back, and if the electrons have opposite spin, one of them is able to escape and generate a current. Otherwise, no electron escapes and no current is generated. So how does this work? The whole point of using spin as a flippable bit was that spin is not affected by electric fields. However, electron spin is coupled to the electron's orbital. So by perturbing the electron's position, we can also affect its spin. Hence, by generating oscillating electric fields, we can cause the electron to move around like so causing this position to shift according to the strength of the electric field. The math gets a bit hairy, so let's break this down. This electron here is currently subjected to a constant magnetic field. So as we subject it to an oscillating electric field, we cause the position of the electron to shift. As we see here, the magnetic field that the electron experiences is affected by its position. So by causing its position to oscillate, we effectively cause an effective oscillating magnetic field. And this is the exact oscillating magnetic field that we need to flip the spin of the electron. Now let's take a look at a specific design of this spin orbit qubit. This image here is a qubit in an indium arsenide nanowire. Indium arsenide is a current material of choice because of the strong spin orbit couplings. This means we don't require as strong electric fields to flip the spin of the qubits. This design is nearly identical as the one we've seen before. You have the source, where, where our electrons come from, and the drain, where they go. And we have a bunch of gates here that manipulate the energy levels of the wells. These gates, 1 through 5, correspond to the bars right here. 
the electrons come from this source end and end up at the drain. Bar 4 generates an oscillating electric field that flips the spin according to how long the field is present. So at this time, the spin is flipped to this orientation, and at this time, the spin is flipped to this orientation, and so on. Let's take a closer look at these gates. Gates 1, 3, and 5 cause these energy bumps, which keep the electrons trapped. Gates 2 and 4 are these energy wells, which maintains the positions of these electrons. Now, this system has the same sequence of events that we've seen before. Initialization, manipulation, and readout. During manipulation, only spin-up electrons are able to tunnel into the L-well and remain there. During manipulation, the energy well of the electron is plunged much deeper, and then a burst of electric waves is sent to flip the spin of this red electron. During readout, the electron's energy level is brought back to its normal level, so that if and only if the red electron and the green electron have opposite spins, it is able to tunnel into the right well and into the drain. Otherwise, they have the same spin and it is not able to tunnel. Thus, this is the same system we've seen before, where opposite spins cause a current and same spins have no current. To confirm that this Indian arsenide system was actually manipulating the electrons with their own electric fields rather than outside noise, they had to measure a couple of parameters. They first measured the current as a sweep of magnetic field and resonance frequency. And as you can see, the white bands here refer to locations where they were able to measure strong currents, and this is when they were able to flip the electrons so that they have opposite spins. The dull areas are areas where they were unable to flip the electrons to have opposite spins. And as you can see, these lines match very well with the equation here, which demonstrate that the frequency is proportional to the magnetic field. This means that they were able to flip the electron as a function of their own electric fields, and not of some outside noise. They were also able to measure the Rabi oscillations, which is also a very strong demonstration of coherence control. And they were able to fit these to a function, which provided the linear relationship between voltage and electric field frequencies. And this linear relationship is again a strong hallmark of coherent control of qubits. The group then measured Ramsey fringe contrasts to determine the decoherence times. Now, we haven't talked about Ramsey fringe contrasts before, but they're very similar to the idea of Rabi oscillations. Here, they measure the difference between the peak and the trough to determine contrast. As you can see, at 5 nanoseconds, these are very pronounced waves. However, at 20 nanoseconds, you can barely see a pattern in the green dots here. So, the, we take the contrasts and fit them to a sigmoid curve. And from this, we were able to obtain a decoherence time of about 8 nanoseconds. Now, 8 nanoseconds is not a good decoherence time, because this is on the same order of magnitude of most gate operations. This means the qubits may decohere before they even have a chance to be used. However, with Han Echo, we are able to increase the decoherence time to about 50 nanoseconds. And with CPMG, we can obtain coherence times of up to 150 nanoseconds. Now, I won't go into what this or the Han Echo is right now, but the gist of it is that there are a series of manipulations of spin that can decouple the qubit from the surrounding noise. So even though we are able to obtain coherence times of up to 150 nanoseconds, this is still orders of magnitudes worse than the previous case with the spin qubits in sem semiconductors, which had coherence times of up to a millisecond. And this is because there are many more stray electric fields than magnetic fields in atom lattices. And so any noise has a much greater effect on the spin orbit qubits than the simple spin qubits. So as great as spin orbit qubits are, they heavily suffer in coherence times, and this poses a great challenge to using them in quantum computers. Yet, one development that this spin orbit coupling allows is long-range qubit interactions. The Peterson group developed a superconducting semiconductor architecture that uses the principle of circuit quantum electrodynamics, or QED, to couple the spin of the qubit to the superconducting phase. Doesn't make any sense? That's okay, we'll go into it. If we zoom into this chip, we will see a very familiar picture. There are two energy wells here and here. There's an energy barrier that prevents tunneling unless they have opposite spins. And you have a source and a drain. 
However, a key difference with this new architecture is that now we can couple the spin of the electron with the phase of the superconductor. A complete understanding of how this works requires a crash course on superconductors and a lot of math that's beyond the scope of this video. But the general idea is that superconductors have this property we call phase. And the position of the charge is coupled with that phase. And because of spin orbit coupling, spin is then also coupled with the phase. So if we take a look at these equations, here is the Hamiltonian for the spin by themselves, and this is a Hamilt total Hamiltonian with the spin, the coupled orbit, and the superconducting phase. And these parameters here reveal the decay rate of the superconducting phase. To obtain a more intuitive understanding of this, we take a look at these two electrons here and here. The closer their energy wells are to each other, the more likely they are to constantly flip between one another, which induces this phase shift in the superconductor. So if we take a look at this graph on the left, we see VL and VR here. So if you're in this top left quadrant, we have VR greater than VL, which means the depth of the energy well on the left is greater than the depth of the energy well on the right. And the closer they are to each other, the greater the phase shift. And as we can see from this line, this is where the two voltages are equal to each other. And this induces the greatest phase shift of around negative 20 degrees. If we take a look at the graph on the right, we can see the exact dependence on the difference in phase shift with the superconducting phase. Because of this coupling, we are now able to read the spin of the qubit with the superconducting phase. That means we can couple the spin of the qubit here with the superconductor in position A, and then perform a measurement on that superconducting phase in some distant position B. Thus, this group was able to perform long-range measurements of the Rabe oscillation, and this is the same rapid oscillations we've seen, except this time the y-axis is a phase instead of a current. And so this is demonstration of coherent control, this time with long distance measurements. The circuit QED applications face similar challenges to the issues surrounding spin orbit qubits overall. Because we're now using electric fields to manipulate the qubits, as expected, our coherence times are again much less than the competing technologies. The coupling rate also isn't great enough to guarantee successful coupling before qubits cohere. With dynamic decoupling and different materials, this architecture could potentially see decoupling rates of up to 1 MHz and an increase in coherence times. But still, lots of work needs to be done. Despite all of its challenges, spin-orbit qubits provide very exciting possibilities for the future of quantum computing. With its long-range coupling and easy manipulations, they can form the basic building blocks of quantum computers, realizable not in large rooms full of giant magnets, but on small chips in our personal computers.